Chris, we can start because people are gathering and then, you know, it's uh, 5.30. So it just, uh, it's questions, it's questions. So that hasn't have to be, you know, not, not everyone needs to be there. Uh, maybe what I could do is speak, I'm trying to think for a moment. Um, let, let me, uh, regarding, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to think back to the questions that I've received over the last two days. I have about two pages of them and uh, or about 10, 11 questions. And what I did yesterday, I don't, I don't know whether the individuals who posed the questions will have necessarily heard it. But um, I was I was answering them. Um, quite indirectly, maybe even somewhat elusively, but I was trying to attend to those questions. I didn't, uh, a couple I didn't go to directly, um, but, uh, but I was speaking to the questions in the course of the, um, uh, in the course of the discussion. Uh, there were a couple questions that um, I wanted to return to possibly, um, or at least to, 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 do, um, to consider in, in a, Bit at a bit greater length, but um, uh, maybe I should see how this this works as we go forward. Let me just uh, pick up one that uh, Ian Rowland uh, presented to me. He was asking whether um, the um, the analysis of Heidegger uh, didn't imply, and I'm, uh, Ian, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm twisting this because it's been a day or so since I read your question, but. Uh, whether this didn't imply something like an overcoming of human finitude in the relation to being. And that's what I was trying to um, describe yesterday when I talked about the sublation of uh, Antigone's, um, what, what I think it was describing as her stance in the polis and uh, in that extreme uh, position that, um, that she was assuming in this passage, as he's describing it, passage toward becoming homely. She's answering purely to uh, what he simply names there as being. And, um, and, and, and this is where I was objecting to his analysis because it seems to me that he is at that point um, uh, leaving aside the meditation on death or at least the important aspects of the meditation on death that have guided him thus, at least up through the, through the existential analytic. And well, I think is part of what makes the existential analytic so important. In other words, there's a thought of finitude in, in the early Heidegger that is, I think, tremendously um, important for, um, for us um, in, in the post-war period and for the thinkers who followed um, Heidegger. So it's, 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 I was trying to point to something that I find utterly um, problematic at that point in Heidegger and was trying to say that Antigone's philia carries us, um, her philia for death, as I was trying to describe it, carries us into um, a, a, a question about death that Heidegger has quite failed to, um, to recognize or to, to follow. And um, ultimately, I think that uh, Blanchot is the one who, at least um, for me, takes us most um, deeply into that space or into that traversal or into that desert that um, Antigone is traversing at the end of the play. In, in a certain sense, I, I would say all of Blanchot's oeuvre takes, it sort of moves through that space that Antigone is in um, after this, the, the point of her uh, lamentation. Um, and what she described as being uh, no longer with the living, not yet with the dead, neither living nor dead in, in, a, in, a, in some place between as alien to, to, uh, to the world. Um, twice the word comes up that she, she is an alien or in, in a kind of exile. And so a, a Blanchot, Blanchot's thinking traverses this space, uh, traverses, enters, engages, um, uh, thinks from this space of exile that um, Antigone is in. And 
quite frequently in a, in a meditation on, on death and the relation to death. And then what he calls, as I was trying to say yesterday, um, the, the passions, um, well, I actually named this the passions of finitude. Um, passions of finitude being fear, malheur, uh, affliction, um, and uh, anguish or anxiety. Uh, those are the ones that he names in uh, The Step Not Beyond. Also love, as I mentioned. And these are all experiences of what Blanchot considers to be a dying, um, in the sense that, that I tried to develop very quickly yesterday when I said there's a, in, in, in Blanchot a thought of a, another death or a second death. And uh, these, these passions are, are a suffering of a kind of dying. And they might be linked then to what um, Antigone is describing insofar as Blanchot understands these to be the passions, passions that are shared, humanly shared in what he understands to be community. So um, this is where I see the, 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 the step to be taken with Blanchot um, in reading Antigone. And uh, as, as I was mentioning, it's, well, it's quite extraordinary to me that Blanchot doesn't talk about Antigone. Were you able to hear me in the, what I was just saying? Hello, uh, Piruz? Because um, you muted yourself. We couldn't hear you for the wait, 15 for, seconds. For just about five seconds, though. Ah, OK, because it suddenly went I was afraid that everything I'd said had been irredeemably lost. Uh, but no, just the last five seconds. Um, no, no, I took I had been, um, I'd mentioned that I, uh, I, I was thanking Jonathan Bennett for confirming my um, my recollection that there was no reference to Antigone outside a, a little appearance on the back of a, a, a um, Le Très Haut, which was republished in 1988, I think it was. And there, uh, there's a reference to Antigone, but otherwise it doesn't appear. And yet, as, uh, what I want to suggest is that it's Blanchot perhaps who can best help us think this suffering of the Dinon that, um, that, that Antigone um, undertakes in her uh, tragic course. Um, there are a couple um, questions coming in, but let me continue. I think uh, people will have had, a ch those who are joining us will have had a chance to come in. And I wanted to um, just sort of complete the trajectory I was taking yesterday with Blanchot. So I will do that um, for a few minutes, maybe 15 or so, and um, see where that takes me. And then I will come to um, the questions that are before me. Maybe I'll give it a bit more than 15 minutes because I don't have a lot of questions as yet. But let me let me continue with where I had left off. And that was um, in uh, at the point I had, um, I was talking about Antigone and her uh, refusal. And I had evoked in uh, previously in reading um, Blanchot on Bataille and in his commemorative memorializing statements um, on Bataille and also on Robert Antenne, his notion of a relation to the other and what he calls their effacement. Um, he, he tries to think the possibility of a relation with the, the passing or past other um, from the grounds of what he calls effacement. And he uses this a phrase um, that is, is it echoes throughout his post-war writing. It's it's tout s'efface, tout doit s'effacer. Everything, and we translate literally, effaces itself. Um, uh, everything must fade. So everything fades. Everything must fade. And this is a, um, in a certain sense, it has a kind of a everyday sense. Everything passes. We must accept this passing. But I, I think he gives it a much deeper charge and it almost becomes actually a, a kind of has a kind of almost pre-socratic charge to it at certain points um in any case he's trying to he, he, you remember in the essay on Bataille he says that um we must honor the effacement of the other which means not attempting to commemorate them in their death in some way that makes them relive uh, but rather we must in some way confront the nothing of that movement of effacement which effaces itself in its very occurrence and thus um, is, is almost impossible of access and he says except insofar as there is something in us that answers this in other words that we 
we too in our being are um, can well are exposed to effacement if we can um, open to this. And that all of all of his writing is in a certain sense an attempt to open to this and to explore the space of this experience of dying or effacement. Now, in the um, little uh, texts on Robert Antin, from which I, I read just a couple sentences um, on the first day, um, Blanchot ends um, with a, an affirmation of the possibility of being with the other, uh, even in and through this effacement. And, and, and he, he speaks of a kind of accompaniment of the other. And he suggests that this is achieved through, well, through, I don't want to say a work, but it's the, it's, it's the writing that, that he does. And this, this, this meditation, this, this reflection. Um, and I, it's very striking. He speaks of, of a plenitude in this relation. And I, when I first read it, I was completely shocked. Well, how is Blanchet using a word like plenitude? But the word seems to echo uh, with something he says in his discussion of community in the unavailable community. And um, in, in, a, in a very interesting way, when he starts talking about the notion of the people. Um, and so I, I think I mentioned yesterday um, at, at near the end that I, I often ask myself um, what, in reading Antigone, when Hemon starts, he says, there are dark murmurings uh, throughout the city um, that, that, that she is in the right. And um, I, it, 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 it's, 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 it's intriguing and also, um, uh, I can say it's a little bit enigmatic. Um, we have no access to those murmurings. We don't know who this people is, um, aside from what the chorus reflects of their, um, their response, their own suffering of, of what they're seeing uh, with Antigone. So we know, at least we, we have a pretty strong sense that yes, indeed, the, the, the people is, is responding to what's happening to Antigone, but uh, we, have no, um, uh, we have no evidence of that. And we have no evidence of, so we have no evidence of what might follow this tragedy. Uh, what, what um, you know, I, I mentioned that Lacan ridicules La, uh, Hegel for evoking some sort of reconciliation. And he says, yeah, I'd like to see what kind of reconciliation comes after this. But um, Blanchot talks about a, a, a form of manifestation, I'm, I'm using the French, manifestation, uh, a, a demonstration of the people following a, a massacre that occurred. Um, actually, there were two massacres, as I mentioned, one in 1961 and second in 1962. In 61, in October, um, quite uh, a, a very large number of people were killed in, in, a, in a brutal police action that was concerted against um, protesters who were um, uh, uh, contesting the Algerian uh, conflict and the French involvement in Algeria. Uh, this was a Maurice uh, Papon. Papon was, a, was the, uh, uh, the police uh, minister who um, affected a, a very, very brutal oppression and hundreds died. They don't know the exact number. Some, some were beaten and thrown into the sand. It was a brutal, ugly event. And then in February 1962, there was another um, protest that occurred in, in the same, at the same site. And as I remember, eight people were killed on that occasion. Um, again, brutal police action in response. And there followed um, a manifestation, um, a, a, a gathering, an assembly of people, which was apparently very large. Um, I, I'm, I hesitate to cite numbers, but I think I remember reading not long ago that there were as many as half a million people um, assembly. Forgive me if I have that wrong, but it, the number is actually not um, imp not so important um, because, as as what Blanchot will say is, this is a number. Um, that in itself represents a, uh, an integral whole. And, and there in that in integralité uh, or that whole that he refers to, I'm hearing plenitude. Um, there, there, is a, uh, there is a plenitude of a response on the part of a, um, of, of a, of a people.
Wonder, I may be touching my second monitor in a way that's prompting that mute button. Um, so forgive me for muting for a second there. Um, I want so I want to read a, a few paragraphs which touch upon this um, the nature of this um, this manifestation that that occurs. Blanchot is trying to think about who the people is, um, and he has uh, uh, at least before this this text on um, a couple occasions he he refers to the people as a in a way that is um, it's somewhat enigmatic, and it's uh, you know he will he will talk for example actually a little bit later in, in the instant of my death he will speak of suffering humanity. Um, it sounds very Christian in this way, but I I don't think that's the way he intends it. Um, suffering humanity is humanity that suffers the passions to which I referred. Uh, in other words, a humanity that is sharing the affliction, and um, he points in particular to afflictions that are. Um, sociopolitically, um, uh, how could I say, um, created, uh, but also afflictions such as sickness or illness. Um, and, um, and he says, in such affliction, there is that they, they touch upon an extreme where there's an opening upon a kind of a, an abyss. And that is where we touch upon the dying that he is um, attentive to, this other dying. So um, there is. He, he speaks of humanity as sharing affliction in, in certain, certain circumstances. And one of these is his experience in the Second World War um, that he recounts in the little text called The Instant of My Death. Um, so I think he's talking here about suffering humanity. It is, um, but it is, it, it is a, it's an assembly that is taking over from those who were protesting and who were killed in, the, in, the, in that protest. Very much in the way that Blanchot takes over from Robert Antelme, what, what he calls the night that is watched over in that little text I was reading. Um, Blanchot takes the position of the one uh, who says, do not forget, or um, invites to a recollection, a remembrance of uh, effacement. So let me just read that then. I, I think I've given enough, um, enough insufficient background. Um, so Blanchot was quite moved by the events of 68. Um, it was as though everything that he had been hoping for and dreaming of uh, in terms of a political um, explosion suddenly occurred. And he was in, in a almost ecstatic, uh, certainly very uh, enthusiastic state. Um, and in, in the, the Annavalbo community in the second part, he takes up the, the experience of May 68. He also talks about this in, in the little book called Michel Foucault, as I imagine him, in which he talks about an encounter with Michel Foucault on the street. Um, but uh, it, he, is, he's, he's, he was particularly fascinated by the kind of friendship that occurs in 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 that uh, in those in those manifestations of sixty eight, and they make him then recall this event at Sharon, which was in nineteen sixty two, and and he, he approaches that in in the passage that I want to read. Okay, um, so he's talking about sixty eight, and he says he speaks of this sort of he says the spontaneous communication that was happening at this moment that sort of poetry in the streets uh, in, in which the freedom of speech in the very strongest sense was manifest and being relayed um, in, in this assembly which was um, again an assembly of a people we would say perhaps so um this spontaneous community, poetry was an everyday affair. He said spontaneous communication in the sense that it seemed to hold back nothing. Was nothing else than communication communicating with its transparent immediate self. Almost like a celebration of communication as such. In spite of the fights, the debates, the controversies where calculating intelligence expressed itself less than a nearly pure effervescence. At any rate, an effervescence without contempt neither highbrow nor lowbrow. And this is a point that I want to come to, this idea of an enthusiasm or at least a coming together that is without hatred or without, uh, as, he, as he will say in, in a few moments, without resentment, or without the negativity of resentment. And I, he's, he's referring to Nietzsche as we'll see. Because of that, one could have the presentment that with authority overthrown or rather neglected, 
a sort of communism declared itself, a communism of a kind never experienced before in which no ideology was able to recuperate or claim as its own, no serious attempts at reforms, but an innocent presence, supremely uncanny because of that. <laughs> Interesting phrase. This is Pierre Jaris's translation. Um, this is the, the phrase in French is supremement insolite. So uh, uncanny works as a translation, um, though it's, it's uh, unfortunately it's not exactly the uncanny we've been reading about in, in Heidegger. But still, an innocent presence, supremely uncanny because of that, which in the eyes of the men of power and eluding their analyses could only be put down with typical sociological phrases such as Shenli. That is to say, the carnival, carnival, carnivalesque redoubling of their own dis disarray the disarray of a command that no longer committed anything, not even itself, contemplating without seeing it, its own inexplicable ruin. Sometimes I wonder if we're not close to that today. Uh, we have a carnivalesque disarray in our um, political uh, leadership, uh, which is all too apparent. And, and uh, but the question we're asking, I think, is what is the nature of the response to this? Um, can this response proceed from a remembrance of uh, what Antigone points to for us, for example. I continue, an innocent presence, a common presence, René Char says, ignoring its limits, political because of its refusal to exclude anything and its awareness that it was as such the immediate universal. I mean, he seems to be he's speaking to Hegel in some way, but it's, it's really quite interesting the way he's, he's mobilizing words like plenitude or um, accompaniment or here, immediate universal. So I, I continue, political because of its refusal to exclude anything in its awareness that it was as such the immediate universal with the impossible as its only challenge, but without determined political wills and therefore at the mercy of any sudden push by the formal institutions against which it refused to react. Again, the sentiment is a reactive position of negating the other in response to what is uh, um, experienced as uh, an overwhelming um, power of the other. And so the, the, the self retreats in, in a kind of negation of that other. This is Nietzsche's account of the sentiment. It is that absence of reaction. In other words, the, the affirmation is so strong in the presence of this manifestation that's reaction is, is, is they're beyond reaction, uh, beyond that kind of negativity of resentment. It is that absence of reaction, Nietzsche could be said to be its inspiration, which permitted the adverse manifestation to develop and which it would have been easy to prevent or fight. So in fact, he recognizes by not reacting, the uh, manifestants were vulnerable. Blanchot affirms that vulnerability. Um, it says, yes, this is part of what was being displayed at that moment. Everything was accepted. The impossibility of recognizing an enemy. This is Antigone, I share in love, not in hatred. The impossibility of recognizing an enemy, of taking into account a particular form of adversity, all that was vivifying while hastening the revolution, though there was nothing to be resolved given that the event had taken place. The event, had it taken place? Very blush, and I won't pause on that. That was and still is the ambiguity of presence understood as instantly realized utopia and therefore without future, therefore without present in suspension as if to open time to a beyond of its usual determinations. Presence of the people, recourse to that complacent word was already abusive, one heard of the people all the time. Or else it had to be understood not as the totality of social forces ready to make particular political decisions, but in its instinctive refusal to accept any power in its absolute mistrust in identifying with a power to which they would dig out, delegate themselves, therefore in its declaration of impotence. Hence the ambiguity of the committees that multiplied, pretending to organize disorganization while respecting the latter, and that were not supposed to distinguish themselves from the anonymous and innumerable crowd, from the people spontaneously demonstrating. Thus the actionless action committees difficulty of being as you probably know about 68, there were these multiplication of committees and groups trying to organize and, and take up what was happening. But Blanchard is saying this was actually a disorganization that could not be so organized. Thus the actionless action committee's difficulty of being, or that of the circle of friends who disavowed their previous friendship in order to call upon friendship, camaraderie without preliminaries, 
mobilized by the requirement of being there, not as a person or subject, but as the demonstrators of a movement fraternally anonymous and impersonal. A movement fraternally, it's curious he uses fraternity in these pages and I'm, I can't really pause over that, but he's talking about liberté, égalité, fraternité. Um, and he sees this, uh, he uses nevertheless this, 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 um, this masculine um, adjective um, to describe the, the coming together. It's problematic, I'd say. But um, we, of course, we remember Antigone is doing that for her brother. Um, but I, I, I emphasize this sentence again, thus the actionless, actionless action can be difficult of being difficulty of being or that of the circle of friends who disavowed their previous friendship in order to call upon friendship, mobilized, mobilized by the requirement of being there. There's an exigency that they are experiencing at this moment. They must present themselves there in this site left vacant, vacant by those who were killed. There is, and this is, this is where, this is where the question of the political is emerging. What is that exigency of being there? To which, the, um, to which the demonstrators are responding. He continues, presence of the people and their limitless power, which in order not to limit itself, accepts doing nothing. I believe that in the still contemporary period that has not been a clearer example than the one that affirmed itself with sovereign amplitude when, amplitude, when to walk in procession for the dead of Sharon, an immobile silent crowd gathered, whose number there was no reason to count because there was nothing to be added nothing to be subtracted. It was there as a whole, not to be counted, not to be numbered, not even as a closed totality, but as an integrality, integrality, surpassing any whole, imposing itself calmly beyond itself. A power supreme because it included without feeling diminished its virtual and absolute powerlessness, symbolized accurately by the fact that it was there as an extension of those who could no longer be there. Again, I hear that exigency of being there. It was there as an extension of those who could no longer be there, those assassinated at Sharon. The infinite answering the call of finitude and prolonging it while opposing it. The infinite answering the call of finitude and prolonging it while opposing it. This is extremely difficult to think, uh, obviously, uh, the relation between the infinite and the finite, the infinite of this assembly in relation to the finitude of those dead who are making the, that, uh, making those dead are in some way accompanying them, giving them some form of survival, right? prolonging that their own finitude while opposing it. Now, the nature of opposition there is this can't be dialectical. It's, it's got to be something else. But I believe that a form of community happened then, different from the one whose character we had thought to have defined, and he's speaking earlier in the text, one of those moments when communism and community meet up and ignore that they have realized themselves by losing themselves immediately. It must not last. This is the effacement. It must not last. It must have no part in any kind of duration. That was understood on that exceptional day. Nobody had to give the order to disband. Dispersal happened out of the same necessity that had gathered the innumerable. Separation was instantaneous, without any remainder, without any of those nostalgic sequels that alter the true demonstration by pretending to carry on as combat groups. The people are not like that. They are there, then they are no longer there. They ignore, they ignore the structure that could stabilize them. Presence and absence, if not merged, at least exchange themselves virtually. That is what makes them formidable for the holders of a power that does not, not acknowledge them. Not letting themselves be grasped, being as much the dissolution of the social fact as the stubborn obstinacy to reinvent the latter in a sovereignty the law cannot circumscribe as it challenges it while maintaining itself as its foundation. So a sovereignty that is at the foundation of the law, but which the law itself cannot contain, cannot circumscribe, as it puts it. Um, a sovereignty that exceeds the law, even while it's, in a certain sense, powerless with respect to state power. And this is the, uh, I suppose we could say, this is the redefinition of the, 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 um, 
the opposition that we, we take over from Hegel in the Antigone story between the state and um, and this other order, which is um, served by Antigone. Okay, now uh, this is what I wanted to um, at least to, to simply to to mark for you how, how, what follows um, what we read in Antigone, and I think that this. This friendship he evokes is, is partly um, the answer, an answer, excuse me. Um, but obviously it is not a sufficient answer um, in any sense. And, and it's in that respect that I want to um, take up um, a, a little bit what, um, a question that came from Nathan Filbert, um, which was, uh, all right, how do we think about the meaning for this uh, of, of what we have traversed in these texts, Antigone, uh, Heidegger, Lacan, Blanchot? How do we think of that about that in the contemporary situation? Um, I, uh, I, 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 what I, part of what I want to say is this: such a uh, that no such answer can be given immediately because what we are. Um, what I have been trying to follow, what I'm trying to follow in Antigone's procession in that exile in which she stands is a, is a, is a condition that is actually, is pre-political in, in, in some measure. Um, pre-political, but really at the very limit of the political. And this, is, this limit is being remarked again, I think by Blanchot when he talks about this, this community, this sharing. But then the question is, all right, um, how, uh, what, what now? Um, the, you know, the first, um, you know, the first thing I would just say, and, and I, I, I don't want to attempt to answer this question in, in any, um, uh, how can I say, in, in, in any, comprehensive or even final way, because I, I actually believe that we're, we are confronting here a, a real question. That is, uh, that is the re in a certain sense, the real, one of the real problems that face us in, 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 in trying to think how one assumes an ethico-political relation in a, um, in a political manner. Um, this is, Blanchot will say, very um, explicitly in, in one of his uh, efforts to address the history of his thinking about politics, including the right-wing period and, and the left-wing period. Um, he will say that he's working toward a politics to come. And I think part of what he's trying to say is that we are in no position from where we stand today with a metaphysical understanding of what the, the political is. We are in no position to to in a sense, write a politics or create a politics um, in, in some theoretical sense uh, that would um, speak to this ethical political urgency that actually I was just reading about the exigency to be there in the manner that, that he was describing. Um, we, this, this, is, this is the task, precisely. The, the task is to think this, the task is to uh, assume this. But obviously in a time like the one we're in, the task couldn't be more, um, more urgent, um, more pressing. And, um, and so I, I, well, I'm sort of trying to take us to this point of extreme difficulty and not attempt any kind of easy uh, resolution or, or give any kind of easy answer. Um, first of all, I, I, you know, I think we are in a time when there are creons and antigones um, um, uh, about, how should I put it? Um, I don't think I need to, to talk too much about the, um, the Creon-like character um, uh, of, of, our, of some of our leaders, um, but I've been astonished to see the way in which the appeal to a warlike stance has been taken up by um, some of the, the right wing. Um, and if you, if you think back to Hegel's account, which Derrida um, I didn't have you read Hegel, but I, I asked, I suggested you read Derrida. Derrida deploys this you know, beautifully, analyzes it beautifully. Um, of course, the, the state uh, mobilizes war in order to break up the prerogative of the family um, and the kinship relations to which uh, Antigone speaks. 
And that's precisely what has, has happened in our, in our circumstances. This, this claim that we must be warriors in fighting for, for what? In, in this case, the economy. And obviously the economy and, uh, is, is not the economy of the people um, in, in, in our current situation. So um, we, have, we have Creons um, who are as no less delirious than Creon at certain points. Um, and, uh, you know, one has to think this could end tragically, but unfortunately um, for a lot of us. Um, the, on the other hand, we have Antigones. Um, and here I want to be especially cautious and not plain too much, but um, I think that we are attending to uh, we, I, I'd say a lot of people, um, and you see this throughout the media, people trying to reach in some way towards those wor healthcare workers, those working on the front line, or those obliged to work um, because they have no other choice um, and who are facing possible death in, that, in those actions. Um, there is a, there's a, an, an attention to them, uh, I think, extremely important right now. That we, 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 again, we have this problematic we, um, but many of us are sort of reaching to them uh, in, in, with, with real difficulty, troubled by the, the uh, I'm gonna say the, the, the inadequacy of, of our possibility of uh, acknowledgement. Um, one, one healthcare worker was cited in, um, I can think I maybe I saw it in, I'm sorry, I can't remember what, what, what context, but they said um, very strongly in relation to some of the um, words used about them, you know, they were being called heroes. And she said, I do not want to be called a hero. I didn't want this. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a hero, I'm a martyr. At which point I was uh, very struck because of course martyr means witness, but also it's um, in Greek, but it's also um, it describes the position of the tragic hero, hero or heroine. And, um, and the, uh, so those words were, were, were quite um, had a Sophoclean irony about them. Um, the, I, I think that, so we have a kind of almost uh, Antigonian uh, scenario uh, that has, has taken shape. And um, the question is uh, how to proceed. Now, I, in a certain sense, in, in, in the act of trying to think through texts like these. Um, we are, we're in a space of recollection, remembrance, thought, in some cases writing. Um, and, uh, and this is something that might be pursued in art. It might be pursued, as I said, in thought. It might be pursued in teaching and exchange. It might be pursued in a whole range of ways, but we're, we're there attempting to find relation, it seems to me. And, and, the, and I don't, uh, I, I think that's terribly important. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, that's what, um, that's what we um, teaching and learning and thinking together um, in a community in this intellectual society um, are, are called to do in some measure. But we're also called, of course, to, to find other forms of response in and through that reflection. And this is where we come to that problem of what, uh, what, what, is, what is the step? To be taken now. Um, what steps can be taken now? Um, how do how do we answer? Blanchot's um, response to this question uh, was one that he was. In late fifties, Blanchot started talking about a, a double response. Um, she, he said, um, Chris, you muted yourself with the papers. With the papers? Yeah, something happened, you lower down the, the volume, people cannot hear you well. Right, volume, I need to help find the volume here. Um, maybe, does this help at all? Have I helped at all with that? No, no, just a second, let me just. Get back, Piruiz. Oh, 
audio settings. Let me check audio settings. I don't understand how this is happening. Um, microphone. Hi, Chris. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you, is it possible your papers are over the microphone and they're, they're resting on the keyboard itself? No, that's not happening. Um, then the other thing to, to check is actually see your volume input. Um, I'm not sure if you know how to do that, but- uh, I'm looking at settings right now, um, but I don't understand. Uh, even I'm having trouble hearing you right now, so. Okay, I'm looking at settings. Uh huh. And there should be a volume input under settings, and then you can drag that dial up, and uh, it'll increase your volume input. It's not letting me drag. I'm able to drag output volume, input volume. Is... Okay. So then, um, and I'm sorry to everybody uh, as we're dealing with this, but you know we're live, so. Um, the other possibility is because you have two computers connected that somehow when uh, your papers were jostled that it actually switched to the other microphone of the desktop versus the microphone on your laptop, which is actually closer to your mouth. So what I suggest that you do, and I can't see your screen right now, but remember how we toggled before where oh, there was an option on the left corner? Again. Yeah, there you go. You okay. All right. That wonderful. was uh, that was Gabriel. Um, thank you. Thanks, Gabe. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know what, quite what happened. He'll explain it to me afterwards. Does that sound good now, Peter? Um, am I coming through? Well? Yeah, you sound great. Wonderful okay. job. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Gabe. Um, All right then. So um, I was trying to I was trying to say that. I think when, when this happened, I was trying to say that Blanchot was very acutely concerned with this question of the relation between the, uh, the thought that he was pursuing in his own writing. And as I was saying, this is traversal of that space that Antigone was in, in her exile. Um, he was very concerned about the relation between that and, um, and political uh, action. Because he had what he, he said, I have, I have a political passion. Um, he, he, he wrote uh, a letter to L'Aquila Bout, which is quite well known. It's quite important. I've commented on it elsewhere, but I, uh, it, it's too, too, I, I have to go too far in depth to, to address it here. But he says, I, I, I know a passion for the political, for the, the political thing, la chose politique, um, and, uh, which is, I suppose, the res publica. And um, he develops his way of, or he addresses his way of answering that passion. And he returns to something that, um, uh, actually, I can't remember what he does in that letter, but he does it on many other occasions. Um, he talks about something that he calls a, 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 the double imperative. Um, so Blanchot understands, um, and this is something taken up by Derrida also. Um, Blanchot understands the political passion as requiring both a stance of criticism, let's say, of intervention in a, in a, in a, in a, a dialectically um, informed sense, whereby there is an act of critique, which identifies what must be uh, addressed for the sake of justice. And, and then proceeds in, in, in that critique and requisite acts. So that's intervening in, in political affairs, it's political change. And then he says, but this must be accompanied always by a meditation on uh, what is, let, let me just call the ethical relation at this point. And we've been talking about the ethical relation under the name of friendship in, in thus far. And so Blanchot says that we must pursue at the same time the one relation with the other. And the problem then becomes, and I, I'm not sure that Blanchot was quite satisfied with his own answer on this. In fact, I'm pretty sure he wasn't. Um, the problem then becomes, what is the relation between these two? And I, my effort in reading um, uh, Blanchot in my, in my book, uh, which was entitled Last Steps, uh, my effort was to try to get to, that, to an answer to that question, um, or at least part of my effort. Um, and it seemed to me that one could read him as seeing the ethical 
um, thought and practice, I would say practice in this thinking, writing, um, uh, acts of friendship and dialogue, exchange and so forth, teaching, uh, learning speech together and so on and so forth. Um, Blanchot, I think, understood or was pointing to the possibility of understanding that ethical practice as in some sense priming the political practice so that it's not two uh, activities going on coterminously it's rather one turning the other or priming or moving the other and 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 in a certain sense Blanchot's politics would proceed from a relation um, to the other um, the ethical relation to the other and in this he's very Levinasian um, but at, at the same time, I think he understands the possibility of a relation to justice that, that Levinas, I don't think quite um, uh, was able to produce. That problem of justice, the relation to the third, the, the political relation to the third is extremely problematic for, for Levinas. For Blanchot, yes, it's still problematic, but I think that he sees the possibility in the ethical relation of opening to a political relation that allows for a response to oppression. And, um, and, and the, the challenge with thinking through Blanchot is to, is to think the nature of that response. Um, I think that, and this is what I, I, I try to develop on the name, under the name of a non-resentful politics, because that response exceeds the, um, the dialectical relation established through um, oppression and, and negation of that oppression. And so forth. Um, I, it seems to me that the response he's describing takes its sort of its its, its spring at main uh, 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 it, it comes from a uh, a relation that exceeds the, um, the 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 order of the dialectic, and in that way um, allows for, as I say, a kind of a affirmative uh, affirmative response. So um, I think that Blanchot um, did envision such a thing and and the, the problem facing us is to understand okay how do we how do we pursue the kind of remembrance this is what i've been trying to do in these three days is to evoke a kind of remembrance of the of the relation that antigone evokes under the name of philia how do we how do we move from this rem remembrance toward some forms of speech or some forms of action um, some intervention and again i don't I, I, I don't want to try to articulate that um, too, too swiftly, but I'm, I'm just trying to lay the, the terms of, of a possible response or conditions of a response, if it is to move at the level um, given to us by Blanchot. Um, okay, so that was my, um, a little bit more than a few minutes, but um, I hope you, I, I, I think maybe it was important that I bring this to a, a kind of, um, uh, this, this trajectory to a kind of completion in the way I just have. Now, I have, um, I have a couple of questions before. Yeah, and Chris, um, uh, I'm just coming on to let you know, we, we, I, I've been switching between uh, the different platforms. So we do have a, a, a lot of questions that have been coming through on the YouTube uh, live stream. I posted them for you with the student's name. So uh, you're welcome to go through any of them and uh, whether you want Nemanja to read the questions or not uh, to you, and maybe that makes it easier, uh, just let us know. Well, let me, um, you know what? I think this would be a good moment for me to take a few minutes um, as a kind of break and also to peruse these, peruse, I'll, I'll peruse these questions. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, are these the ones that are in the feed of the q and Is that what you're referring to? That's correct. And okay. uh, so Nemanja will have to read them because I had to switch. And so I can't actually see them, but the two of you can. I can see them. So I will, um, I, I will select, a, I won't be able to answer all of them. And um, I'll just select a few and, and touch upon a few. That, and, Wonderful. Yeah. In response. So let me take this will give me a moment to just recover, recover myself a tiny bit, and then uh, I'll come back and try to address a, a, a bit of what I see there. Sounds perfect. Good. Good. Okay. Seven or eight minutes. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, for today, we, uh, we actually got another uh, music composition. And this is from uh, 
I believe it's Nathan Filbert. And hopefully I'm saying that name, last name correctly. And uh, this is a piece uh, by his uh, son called Lighted Nell. Uh, we won't see the, the image that says uh, break because I won't uh, share the screen, but I'll just play the audio. And just remember for everyone, if uh, you have any songs or um, you have family members that have, that have copyright royalty free songs, send them through and we'll use them during breaks and the end of sessions as we're closing things up. Um, so that uh, YouTube doesn't shut us down for using uh, uh, a copywritten song.
Are you all set, Chris? I am, yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, just uh, make sure you turn on your uh, camera or I can do it for you. I, I, I tried to and it said that the host was um, blocking it. So I guess that's you. Okay, very good. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, I have, yeah, I have got a group of questions here. And I think probably the best thing I can do is just move through them quickly and see where, uh, where they lead. I may not get to all of them. Um, and so I apologize to those I'm, I may not be able to respond to. But let me just try to, I'll try to go quickly and see what, what, I, what I can say. Um, the first and thing- I Yep. I think I uh, also posted uh, some students' names from the YouTube live stream. Yes. Uh, uh, hopefully that's there. I you. have a couple, yes, in, the, in what I have before me. Yep. For example, there's a Cecilia Wu um, in the third question. Okay. So let me go, let me just pick this up. In some cases, I will just read because the questions are, are you know, offer research projects, <laughs> um, and so let me just acknowledge that. Uh, the first is from Mati Palohimo. Uh, would we not say that Antigone is normative? Is it normal to bury, to bury about your brother, to bury, I guess, to, to be concerned with the burial of your brother? Creon would be the criminal today, not Antigone. Well, um, yes. Um, uh, I think that we have two, uh, you know, we have two um, criminal acts in this play. Um, uh, Antigone's transgression uh, of the instituted law and or uh, Creon's law, uh, who's authorized to make that law according to the chorus. And then of course we have Creon's violation of a uh, transgression of the uh, divine order, which Tiresias speaks to very powerfully in, in his, condemnation at the end and, and in his prophecy, which is devastating. But Creon goes to the point very powerfully and says, uh, you, you are violating the, um, the prerogative of, of the dead uh, in this effort to kill him twice, um, you know, to, 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 to punish him when he's, he's already dead. And this is a, uh, well, this is a resentful act in the way that I was trying to evoke a moment ago in part. It's a resentful act and it's a criminal act in, in regard to the, the laws of, of the, the divine laws to which Tiresias is speaking and to which Antigone has in part responded. I don't think you can quite conflate Antigone and Tiresias, but um, to some degree, yes, um, he is speaking from a knowledge of the world of the dead. Um, uh, is uh, uh, you know is is it normative to bury your brother? I, I, this goes to the question of her justification for her act in in the um, in in the passage after her lamentation. Uh, I, I referred to this a little bit yesterday, and uh, and the day before. Um, I see that justification as a bit spurious, and uh, and I think it's it's meant to be that way. I think that what, what, what it sort of says, so does you, it really comes out that this is uh, this, this rationalization of the act um, cannot capture the um, motivation or the impetus um, to which she speaks earlier when she speaks of answering an, an unwritten law. 
Um, and if we follow, La I, I think Lacan's argument is very interesting <clears throat> and when he tries to justify her justification and says she's absolutely right um, in, her, in her argumentation because what she is, do is uh, doing is honoring the name, uh, honoring what the name uh, marks, which is the singular presence, uh, irreducible presence of the human. Um, the difficulty I have with Lacan's argument there is that that would seem to suggest that every um, other, in this sense, um, uh, 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 that everyone is deserving of burial, right? That, that, that this singular relation that Antigone, um, how should I say, honors in her, in her act, um, can be undertaken for any uh, dead person who is philos. And, and then the question is, how do, how do we define that in that context? And that's, that's always singular, that relation. But there is no reason that, that one person should benefit um, from such, such, a, such an act. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a, um, uh, I, I, I try to think about the, the relation of Mitzayn and um, you know, the, 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 uh, the singularity of the, um, the, the, the single Dasein um, in the relation of Mitzayn. And, and Heidegger and Blanchot, and they, I think that they insist quite um, significantly upon this. We have to think a singularity here. Um, and so the way I rephrase this is that we have to think the singularity in its incommensurability. Every other is singularly incommensurable. I think this is a Levinasian type um, phrasing. And, and in that singular incommensurability, there is the same uh, deserving uh, uh, with regard to uh, uh, burial or honoring, honoring the dead. So um, I think that ultimately Antigone's justifications, which come in the first part, when she says she's speaking to, the, to an unwritten law, they speak to a more general, I don't even like this phrase, a general application. But no, I, I think that every other is potentially deserving of this burial. The next one, um, this is from Micah Chapman. The Sophoclean poem projects nature as dinonon being human as to a danotaton. Um, then in the question concerning technology, nature is revealed as a challenged standing reserve and being human is also revealed as standing reserve. How do you think Herlinen's poetic projection of nature and being human? And how does Herlinen's poetry differ from the dynon and the standing reserve? Well, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, the that's the first one I thought of as a research project. But it's, um, you know, because the question goes right to the heart of what Heidegger is um, attempting to address in turning to Herlinen's poetry. In other words, uh, Erlen, uh, Heidegger sees what poetry offers, poetry as being a particular use of language that um, is distinguished among the arts because of its, because it, it involves language um, in, in, its, in, its, in, its, in its special way. Uh, but in a certain sense, all art for Heidegger, if we look at the origin of work of art, all art for Heidegger is devoted in some measure to um, to, uh, how should I say, to its human conditions. Um, I'm, I'm speaking very rapidly there, but um, for Heidegger, the turn to art is an effort to recover something of what he calls the human essence, which he sees as endangered in the order of uh, te technique. Now, um, so in technique, all of nature um, is, uh, is, is, is ordered, in the way of the standing reserve, as Micah mentions. Um, that is to say, it is uh, available to exploitation and the human subject deludes itself into thinking that it is the subject of this process, that the, the agent, the, the master in some way, but in fact, human being is itself just part of this, this, this machination, this, this machine, this, uh, this order. And again, this isn't just, the, uh, this is so frequently confused with technology, uh, simply. Heidegger is not, when he talks about technique, he's not talking about technology in the everyday sense. Um, he's talking about a, an, a, a condition of our relation to beings and that's ordered by techne. Technology names a relation to being. Um, so uh, yes, the turn to poetry is an effort to, um, to think, a, to, 
uncover something of a human essence that is actually threatened by, um, by, by technique. Um, uh, by the way, when the dynon is um, for Heidegger, that is, that's proper to physis. And part of what Hölderlin's poetry is doing is recovering the meaning of physis. So he's recovering the meaning of dynon in a way that makes the human to danotatum and something uncanny, which is capable of dwelling and thereby a different relation to physics and a different relation to the dynon than that of um, technique. Question from uh, the live stream from Cecilia Wu. Uh, sublation of subsistence, can you say more? Oh, um, I see a note here. Nemanja Mitrovic is going to answer this question live. Nemanja, do you want to answer this? Is he there? I don't know, Chris, I'm uh, marking them for you so that every time when you start answering, I'm clicking. This. Okay, sorry. I thought you were jumping in. That's, that would be fine with me if you... <laughs> no, no, no. And then when you finish, I remove it. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. As I, I just mentioned to everybody, you know, this is, exp this is our first go and uh, we're experimenting. We have been learning. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I, I was, I think I'm, in my initial letter, I had asked in some, at least indirectly for your patience, because um, this is, it is experimental. We're trying to master the technology. I discovered yesterday that my stream was not so good in the first part of the session. So I apologize for that, but we learned that we now have to start up a bit sooner and so forth. So it's very useful. We're learning something about the use of questions and answers, how to do this. So it is again, very useful, but it is experimental. So I, I beg your indulgence. <laughs> Um, the sublation of subsistence, uh, this is a, it, it, it is a very, very surprising statement in, in Heidegger and in, in, at that point in the text. I gave the page number, but I think it was probably something like 117 or something in the English translation of the Easter. It's right around that area. Um, I, I, it's very surprising to see Heidegger use that Hegelian term, Aufhebel. But that's the one he uses to talk about the um, the way in which she transcends her, uh, let's just say, her her condition in the polis. Polis is taken in this text in a very broad sense. Polis is the entire realm of human uh, doings. It's not just the state in a um, in, in a political sense. Um, uh, it, it is really the order of it's the order of physics to which humankind, uh, in which humankind lives and acts. So uh, she steps out of that, um, or, or she leaves that in, in her act. And Heidegger describes this when she accepts to suffer the dynon, as she puts it in that prince, um, when she starts this um, uncanny act of becoming homely via becoming unhomely, as Heidegger puts it, she thereby in that response to that to which she's responding, she is carried beyond her, uh, her I'm hesitating here the phrase, a political condition if we say police, but it's not political, it's pre-political. So um, her, 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 her stand her, or her bestand, her condition in the, in, in the polis. Now, so in answering to um, in, in answering to this uh, this other usage, um, th th there is something like this movement of a negation that preserves. She preserves. Uh, she recovers her being in this negation of her um, of her uh, physical condition or phys a condition in the order of physics in the polis. Um, and there, this is where what I find so unnerving, and I see it. Um, I, I would have just, you know, I, I would dismiss that sentence perhaps um, and reading and say, well, what was that about? You know, why is he suddenly referring to Hegel? Um, did he wink at that moment, you know, in the text or something? But no, I, I think that this is perfectly consistent with the analysis. And that's why I was stressing that movement when he starts to identify the relation to death and the relation to being as this, as one or the same. And there we see that, in fact, death, this experience of a, it's not a negation for Heidegger, but it's more an approach to annihilation. But there we see that negation is itself negated um, because it, it is, uh, I, I'm using the Hegelian term, negation is negated in this 
affirmation of the relation to, to being. Um, and or, so that's what I meant by you know, the Hegelian movement and the sublation there. Uh, and, and what's so un, unnerving and troubling about this is the way in which all of the dimensions of the relation to death that someone like Blanchot will explore, and I think in a way which is very consonant with what Antigone is experiencing, um, all of that is, uh, is, is in a certain sense lost um, in, in, this, in this analysis. And, um, and it, it really does, um, it really is a kind of uh, dialectical sublation. And Blanchot has a lot to say about what dialectic sublation loses in its movement of, of negation. It loses precisely the relation to the other death that he describes. That's, there's a passage in um, the writing of the disaster, which is very strong on this. Um, just before the, um, the text that I've spent so much time on, the, the death of the, um, the infants. Um, but he, he talks about the relation to dialectic there and, and what is lost in sublation. I would say this is perfectly pertinent to what Heidegger did at that moment. And it's really quite unnerving uh, to see this because it makes me start to wonder about a lot more in Heidegger in this period um, in terms of what's happening with his, this, this turn that he's making. Um, something really is being lost from the existential analytic, it seems to me. And he certainly has lost the impetus that took him into this analysis of Antigone, in my view, which is to attend to what her living was calling holy pathos. Okay, I am. I could go on, as you can tell. This is right. This is in my uh, uh, very much in the topic that I've been trying to address. But let me see if I can get a couple more answers here. Uh, Micah, um. This is, uh, let, let me just read this very quick. I don't think I'm going to be able to answer this one quickly. Is there a human act that could be, could be neither a holding to the name nor an affirmation of nothing? This question arose by trying to put together how the relation to death is the same as the relation to being. How Antigone's burial of Polynices, which for Lacan is Antigone's suffering of the signifier by holding to the name, which sets the self-opening beings out of the immediate overwhelming assault back into their being and preserves them in this openness to limitation and constancy. And Helen is life is death and death is a life. The way that for the Greek Dasein, death was a life. Being was distributed temporally beyond the death of the body via being determined as permanence and how the absolute nothing of death that may be unique to us. Uh, that's a big question, um, and I'm not sure I'm able to get a handle on, let me, let me just return to the first sentence. Is there a human act that could be neither a holding to the name nor an affirmation of nothing? Well, it would seem to me that perhaps now, in terms of the, the Greek understanding of being there, I, I won't try to respond to that, but it does seem to me that I was trying to address this via Blanchot. Um, and, and by his understanding of what it means to engage the, what I call the passions of finitude and, and community. Um, so that is um, something more than an affirmation of nothing and something more than simply uh, testifying to this, this um, mark of the signifier in, in that, that defines the, the human. Um, but I think that in Lacan, we can certainly pursue this question also. And I, um, but I, there, I, I want to uh, reserve, um, well, just, just to wait for a chance to go back into the text because it's been too long for, for me um, since I read Lacan to really be able to develop that. In other words, the question is, what does Lacan mean by the human in, in, that, in that moment, the human that suffers the signifier? How do we understand that human? Okay, let me um, continue. Piroz, a question from YouTube live stream from the existential investigator. Which definition of carnivalesque are you using with reference to the political leadership? Not the Bactinian, which refers to a leveling of power relation. Well, at that moment I was citing Blanchot. Um, I was citing, um, just so that you have this, um, I was citing from the English translation by Pierre Joris um, from page um, 30. Um, and so I am, I would have to also look, I will look very quickly um, at the French 
um, um, and the word that is used there is, is, hang on one second, please. Carnavalesque. Oh, um, I'm not exactly sure what, uh, where, where Blanchot was taking that, although um, when I read that, 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 that sentence, I was, felt it was a very familiar reference to the, to the, the scene in 68 and the way in which this appellation um, that was applied to the protesters was turned back on, on, the, um, on the government. Um, but the, the protesters were, you know, they were, they were dismissed as, it's just, this is, a, these are children, or these, these are, they're just fooling around out in the streets, it can't be taken seriously. Um, so no, I, I have no idea whether there's a Bactinian um, overtone there. Um, a leveling of power relations, um, in a certain sense, there is a kind of equalization asserted there, but, but uh, from, uh, there's an incommensurable relation between these two forms of, uh, uh, well, there's two forms, the political and the uh, protest, it's demonstrations that are going on. Okay, um, but perhaps there's something more there, forgive me if I'm not recognizing um, more in this reference to Bakhtin. Um, is this like soft messianic power of sovereignty in Walter Benjamin? Um, I'm not sure at what moment uh, Nikola Djokovic um, ask that question. Um, was it perhaps at the moment when I was talking about sovereignty in the people um, from the, the passage in Blanchot? Um, soft messianic power. Um, I, I recognize that phrase in Benjamin um, in, uh, um, when he uses it in reference in the thesis on history, I think. And then also in um, the arcades project, uh, when he talks about the past holding a weak messianic power, um, but the um, and and the job or the job the, the task of criticism, the task of political response is to is to answer the address of the past at the requisite moment. It has to happen in the critical moment. And that uh, answer is, is in a certain sense, an, 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 uh, it's a political, but also in a certain sense, how can I say, a, um, it's a creative act. It's, it, it's an interpretive act. It's also a, a very creative interpretation. And um, at that moment, there is the realization of a, of a, of a connection, uh, a realization, in, uh, or rather, of the weak messianic power that speaks from that moment in the past. And um, I suppose that I would, I wonder if I'm, I'm not, if I haven't been in some way calling upon the weak messianic power of the texts of 68 um, today. Um, but in any case, um, I don't know that Blanchot would be talking about Benjamin in that moment in when he wrote The Unavailable Community. He could well have been. Um, he certainly knew Benjamin's work. Um, next one, Anna Rockwell. Is, if the dwelling as such is the passage from the homely to the unhomely and Antigone and the act of her dying enters the homely through crossing this threshold into the alien state of non-being, what of the thousands of people dying now less willingly? Um, the first part, I, I don't think that Antigone enters dwelling in, in this passage. She's in exile. Um, she is in a terrible suffering in exile um, in this passage between life and death. Um, it, it is, uh, um, so it, it, dwelling is that toward which in Heidegger's account, becoming unhomely in order to answer the call of this other law, uh, dwelling would be that assumption of the other law that in some sense realizes that to which one is called. Um, but, I, I tried to read a couple sentences in, in the Heidegger text, which pretty much suggests that, that dwelling is never a, like an arrival in, in the sense of a, um, a, a, 
Well, in what he calls, if you, if you want to pursue this in 1942 in the lectures on the East Year, in what he calls a remaining, um, and he attributes this to uh, the word, um, um, it attributes to the, to, the, to, to the Greek term pelen. Um, when in that phrase, there's much that is manifold, kolotadainon, I think that's the way the Greek is. You know, my Greek is very fragmentary. But uh, that pola is, is from the infinitive polen, uh, 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 pelen, which we hear in archipelago, for example. And in his meditation on the meaning of that term, he starts to point to an understanding of what a remaining might be in physics and dwelling. But Antigone is not there. And, and I don't see how she could be there in, in, in terms of the, of the passage that's being described, this terrible suffering that she is, that she is undergoing. Um, so the, um, I, I think Antigone's suffering is close to what you then ask about and what you follow. What are the thousands of people dying now less willingly? There's a sense of collective homeliness accessible to them. I, well, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, in these mass burial sites, can one find a sense of collective dignity? Is dignity inherently singular as our own death? What of a communal shared dignity in relation to witnessing the death of the other? Well, perhaps in what I was reading from Blanchot, we can understand the idea, or we can conceive the idea of a community acknowledging community. In other words, that assembly of people at Sharon are carrying forward the, what calls to them from the death of those in the previous protest that had been killed. <clears throat> but I think he's referring probably to both protests and that's a very large number of people, many of whom the bodies were never recovered. It's, it's, it's a terrible incident. Um, Micah, thank you. Thank you, Micah. Um, it's difficult once all of that is put together. Um, it doesn't leave me anywhere prescriptive. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, feel, I feel totally at a loss with regard to the offering of proposals or suggestions in the space of awareness that emerges from the configuration you put together. I think we're in a very, very difficult space. And the, uh, the first thing to do is to enter that space and to try to occupy it. I uh, occupy it, uh, to, to, to live there, to, to not dwell in the sense that Anna was worried about, but rather to uh, suffer this space to, um, to, to, to start the traversal, to remember. This is what I was trying to talk about in terms of remembrance. Remembrance is not a recovery. Remembrance is trying to approach. It's, it's, it's an effort to accede to. And that's what all of this is. How do we accede to the space of suffering, to what calls to us in this moment? How do we, um, how do we honor um, from that experience of this, what I'm calling accession? Um, um, so it, it is, it, 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 what I've tried to do is lay out the task, really. Um, and and I, with, with Blanchot, I was trying to point to ways of thinking about it, but this is a very, this is a research project that's very, 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 very um, involved. Um, from Hatis Karaman, can a, read of, can a reading of Antigone and Philia through another Heideggerian term Besorgen, as in caring for the other, save the heroine from Lacan's reduction to death drive. Um, well, I think that if you, I, 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 I've been very disappointed in Heidegger in, this, in, in, in what we've been reading, but I do think that um, for, for me, the relation of Mitzayin, as he laid it out in Being in Time, required a thought of care that is much closer to the ethical relation that I'm seeking. And I think that in this respect, I'm trying to, uh, I'm, re I'm, I'm interpreting Heidegger in a, in, a, in a certain sense, I'm trying to bring forth a possibility in the text that the text itself denies finally. And we see that denial in that phrase about sublation. Um, the um, Heidegger, as soon as he turns the people into a national subject in, in the early thirties, he has lost that singular relation that he was thinking of Mitzan, it seems to me. Uh, or he adds, becomes extremely problematic. There are signs that it's, he's still struggling with this question. There, there are remarks on what it means for a soldier to go to the front in, in the 34 lectures on Helena that are intriguing, but still problematic. Um, but my view is that basically he, he does not, um, I can say, he's not able 
to carry forward what his own text opens to us as possibility with the thought of Mitzayn. And that's what I have been trying to do, is to recover what Mitzayn has to be. And I say has to be because his own thinking is pointing to this. But he forecloses this, it seems to me. And, uh, and so the, the irreducible character of this, or this incommensurable character, the relation to the other by virtue of the relation to their dying, is something that Heidegger cannot maintain in, in his thinking, it seems to me as he makes this move, as he thinks ethics from ontology. This is Levinas's charge, and I think it's correct that, that ultimately he, um, uh, he, he puts uh, the ethical relation in a secondary relation with respect to ontology. And this is a, a fundamental problem, at least for me. Uh, so we need to recover his notion of care. Um, we then have a question from Hector. I think this is the last one. Regarding filia of death and fraternal love between siblings, would Antigone have taken the same amount of risk if it was Etiocles, the one left to rot outside the city? Was she trying to um, it just moved on me? Um, was she trying to give a dignified burial to her brother or to her favorite brother? This is a question I think the play leaves entirely open, or Antigone leaves entirely open for us. Um, she is not, she's not turning to Antigone the same way. Um, we might say because he did get a burial, um, but I think that there's something probably more fundamental, which has to do with the, again, the familia ate, and, um, and the relations that have, have taken shape in that very singular um, configuration. But um, I, 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 what I tried to say earlier is that I think that Antigone's act, um, if we were to carry this, uh, if, we, if we carry her, her thinking forward from the first part of the play when she evokes this other law, I think that she would be she would give Eteocles a burial if he was not um, receiving one. Um, she would have to, or then I don't quite understand. <laughs> so, um, but again, Antigone is <laughs> not always consistent. Uh, look at poor Esme. Um, But anyway, I think that uh, what I tried to say is that the relation defined by Lacan, um, that the name uh, honors the singular human um, that, that carries it. Um, this relation means that one could extend the same rights to any other. Um, and it's, and that, the, that the kinship relation as she defines it in its singular character, that is to say that only one is irreplaceable for her. Um, this is not adequate to the more fundamental law to which she's answering. Uh, Um, all right, a, a comment in Butler sees Antigones and feminists contra the state. Similarly, I see Antigones and indigenous water protectors who often lay down their lives for this common inorganic resource sustaining all life. Uh, uh, let me accept that as a comment. Um, and then Christopher Zimmerman, I think we're at the end. It's, I, I won't try to proceed. I'm, I'm, I'm already over time. Otherwise, Ian, I'm. I, I won't try to pursue, I'll just accept what you're saying. And as I, as I said, I see many Antigones uh, around us today. <clears throat> um, Christopher, in what ways might we see Antigone, Sophocles play as well as her image as the virus, and then as an antidote? I'm gonna leave that one. Um, I, I, I don't want to play too, um, too insouciantly with, um, with with this material, um, uh, can it become viral? Um, this is up to us, and in the way in which we write and think and share um, what we have experienced and thought, in as much as we've engaged these texts. Um, but it, 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 it is, you know, that it's one of the things about community. You, you, it's that's very striking about Blanche is that you can't count this. Um, the, you, the, the number doesn't matter. What matters is the relation, which is integral when it occurs. Now, how far this spreads um, is another question, but I, I don't think again that it's, it's something that spreads by virtue of its theoretical import entirely. I think it's something that spreads by virtue of the way in which we experience with 
others what we are approaching. Um, and, and so it's not a matter of getting it right in some theoretical sense, which we can then take out into some political action. In terms of the, the, the passage that I've tried to undertake in this seminar is, is not about getting a correct reading of Antigone in order then to address our, our situation today. It's rather, as I said, to try to let Antigone resonate for us so that it becomes the ground of an experience, a thinking experience, perhaps a creative experience that we then take forward. And, and we also take forward in, in, in political acts and in commitments. Um, and <clears throat> when those acts are undertaken, <clears throat> they will have effects on others. And, but this is not something that can be, as I say, um, cannot be thought in terms of a theory practice uh, construction. Um, rather, there is a different kind of communication, a different communion. Uh, you used the word communion, I think, in, in one of your previous questions. But anyway, there's a different community than, um, than one that is uh, constructed according to that theoretical theory practice, tradition, structure. Um, and, and we need to be thinking from community. We need to be thinking from sharing. We need to be thinking from the basis of what Monchot actually calls freedom. And when we try to find freedom for the other, and this is from the hospitality relation. So um, <clears throat> let me let me end with that then. And uh, again, let me thank you sincerely, all of you, for um, undertaking this with me, um, with us, um, in, in our experimentation. And again, I want to thank Nemanja Mitrovic for everything he has done in helping to organize and getting me here. <laughs> it's his idea, and also uh, Peruz Kaleya who has been uh, moderating. Uh, the two of them have been a great technical team and will continue to, to be so as we go into the um, upcoming sessions. Let me remind you, we'll be announcing these on Instagram and, uh, and on our um, uh, Facebook, but also um, on our website um, under the news section. And so I would urge you to visit that. Um, periodically and see what's what's coming. Um, we will have some um, other uh, seminars like this, but I, um, I will we'll also have other events. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with that, let me uh, wish you all, um, all, all well, um, may you be safe. And again, thank you very much for, for joining us. <clears throat>